So, uh, ladies and gents, it's uh, with uh, so much gratitude that uh, we're getting into the last uh, uh, segment uh, session uh, for the day. Uh, the session that has just presided this is, uh, has been centered on fostering sustainable partnerships between uh, the BASPs and uh, the FIs. And uh, at this particular juncture, I don't know if it could be wise to talk fish right now, or is it wise to, for us to talk fish uh, before we went to lunch? But let's see uh, what... Uh, 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 this fish dish is all about, and uh, the session coming in next is centered on uh, investing in Kenyan aquaculture uh, segment. And uh, allow me to introduce Mr. Noah Kipkimboy, who uh, works as a business reporter and anchor uh, at KTN. Noah, probably this is a chance for you to probably just uh, go on stage. Noah is going to take lead and uh, cue uh, in for us, the panelists coming in in this particular segment. And I hope as uh, he takes the session away, you also get to unpack some fish on your plate. Uh, so Noah, are you ready to want your new mic? Uh, the floor is all yours for you to take it up. All right. Thank you, Noah. Thank you very much. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. But at this particular moment, I'd like to invite our panelists. This, this will be the most fun. I know they put us last because they thought, ah, they go, you know, they're closing out. This will be the most fun, trust you me. So I'll, I'll simply have a seat here. I feel you guys are a little bit far. If I had an option, I'll act like a pastor and ask people to move at the seat in front. But I don't have that liberty right now. So I'll proceed straight away to invite Edna Odalo, who is the Managing Director, Afriscope Limited. Please clap for her as she comes on stage and come. Her. Come on, guys. Yes. Yes. Edna, amazing, amazing. That is how models work, and you can learn a thing or two apart from financing how to work on stage. Edna Karibu Sana. Up next, we have Phoebe O'Rourke, who is the Chief Executive Officer, Lamero Consul. Beginning my coffee to Fadali. Amazing, amazing lady. Till she reaches the stage, encourage her as she comes. Yes, some of you are talking about dressing African. That is how we dress African. Well, next time, your aid when you invite me, Kims, I will be in Akitenge. Welcome, uh, Ed, uh, Phoebe O'Rourke from Lamero Consult. We have Samuel Ondiek from DAS Group. Please clap for him as he comes, the gentleman right there, DAS Group. He'll tell us what he's doing with fish farmers. And lastly, we have Dev Okech from Aquaretch. Make sure your company name and your surname always rhyme. Dev Okech from Aquaretch. Welcome on stage, sir. Please appreciate him as he comes. Amazing, amazing, amazing people. Wow. Let's give it up for the DJ. He's doing a good job. I know. All right. Wow. Talk about gender balance. I'm happy because at the fish sector and aqua sector, we are very gender balanced. All right. So starting us off, every story has a history. And when you talk about aquaculture in Kenya, there is a deep history where we've come from and uh, where we are right now. And who better to give us a breakdown of this particular history other than Phoebe War, who is the CEO of Lamero Consult. Phoebe, I mean, we've seen, I look at the graph of aquaculture and aqua sector, you know, performance, they sort of a deep, then we come up, there about 2013, then we start going down again. Give us a brief history, where are we coming from? Uh, my name is Phoebe Wall. once again, I'm still Phoebe. And I've been privileged to have a lot of input in the aquaculture sector for over 15 years in Kenya. That is one of the most delicate sectors that feels ignored, yet very important. Uh, unfortunately, we produce about 100 today metric tons of fish, both wild and farmed. 
I think it has gone up because of the inroads that we've gotten in Lake Trucana. There's quite a bit of beehive in Lake Trucana since the roads were opened. And so you have a lot, quite a bit of fish in um, pro boxes coming down to Kitale into the hinterland of Kenya. We consume about 400 metric tons per annum, and that tells us we have a deficit of 300 metric tons. That's quite huge. How do we close this gap? This gap is closed with imports. Basically, a lot of imports, mainly from China. 80 or 90% of that import is mainly tilapia. The rest is sea fish. I'll not complete the story of the aquaculture without acknowledging and appreciating our third president, uh, our third president the late Mwai Kibaki. Through the economic stimulus project, you cannot complete Kenya's aquaculture story without acknowledging and appreciating the efforts he put into changing the Kenyan aquaculture <laughs> space totally. There were three key areas of impact. One was the consumption of fish. Two was the farming of fish. And three was how the business of fish is done. The economic stimulus project brought about digging of ponds in several counties, I think there were about 15, 16, 17, 18 counties that were given ponds. They identified um, potential fish farm workers who had learned to have the ponds done. They gave feeds, they gave technical support, they even gave the market and left the entrepreneurs to continue. I'm sorry, but I'll tell you this. There's a lot of uptake particularly from my area in the mountains. There was a lot of uptake of that initiative. When we went, I was lucky to be involved in the, um, what you call, tracer study. There was a lot of uptake that most of the people who had started that farming actually bought land or leased land. Some even grew the fish in tanks on top of roofs. That is at the mountain place. And it totally changed their eating habits. Most of them now eat more fish than the Jaluos from the lake region. Fish is consumed heavily in the mountain area and even the Rift Valley. It is fortunate that a lot of projects coming into the country has a component of nutrition which is re-emphasizing the importance of fish. Unfortunately, we do not have enough fish. Hence, the farming of fish, okay. the aquaculture. All right. Last year, I was fortunate we got some work to do a scoping study and a situational and uh, context analysis for the EU in the six coastal region, six coastal counties, to look at what the aquaculture setup is, what are some of the potential aquaculture that could be uptaken and the mariculture. The study was complete. They are now implementing in the six counties. So fish has a history, fish has space, fish has a potential for growth. Thank you. Wow, amazing. That's how you attack a conversation. And uh, you know, you say fish has history and some history is fishy and some of you are asking what is my history with fish maybe technical do you have that picture T just to alleviate any kind of doubt a doubt that is me okay and i was eating fish today ask yourself what are you doing for the aquaculture sector all right that is just a by the way so we experienced the economic stimulus program looking at the numbers 2012, for example, 49,000 farmers, incredible, 70,000 ponds, 2,105 hectares, and a fish, I incredible, this is 2012, 
then come 20 actually production around 2014 thereabout around 24,000 metric tons okay now 2019 18,000 metric tons the acreage 1,800 a reduction from 2,000 the ponds now 60,000 something happened when the economic stimulus package stopped that's why I bring in DS, because you've been on the ground. This transition that we saw, why the sudden drop? My name is Samuel Ondiek, DS Group Kenya Limited. DS Group means uh, development of aquaculture support. Uh, we've been in um, fish business since uh, 2012. And uh, currently we are actually stationed in uh, Kakamega. We have um, an agreement with uh, Kakamega County. Uh, we've actually leased um, one of the factories that was built during the economic stimulus program. And uh, we are currently working also with um, the Elreb counties. Uh, which actually encompasses around about 14 counties. Now, back to your question. I think it's due to over-reliance on uh, subsidies that are given by uh, county governments or the government, and uh, that actually brings in uh, the fact that um, sustainability has to be uh, injected into the system to enable continuity of the business even after um, exit of uh, either development partners or the government from giving subsidies to farmers. Yeah, so that's why we come in and uh, we want uh, this process or the ecosystem to work without any hindrance that might come about in, as a result of uh, over reliance on subsidies. And that is important to note because creating sustainable business in the aquaculture uh, you know sector is very important S and funding is 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 one of the issues because funding actually is a critical pillar when it comes to making business move yeah and uh, I, I'm glad uh, we we have uh, actually Edna with us Edna uh, we've discussed extensively on on the issue of connecting SMEs in the aquaculture sector with, with, with funding, yeah? Now, when we see such a situation, economic stimulus ends, now the businesses are not sustainable, there was sort of over-reliance, and now you come in as, you know, as a bus, for example. How, how do you turn around? How do you create a sustainable aquaculture business, especially falling under the SME category? Okay, um, thank you very much. First, I would like to answer your question of why I love fish. I love fish because fish is tasty. Fish is one of the most nutritious sources of protein and probably one of the first types of uh, meats I ate from the time I was a kid. So that's very important to note. <laughs> so anyway, on the... Uh, over land when transitioning as our, our role as BASPs is actually to ensure the businesses are properly structured. Um, we set up um, policies that um, enable the businesses to just run by themselves, um, to be able to be um, investor ready. We get them more attractive for investors to put in um, to put in their money to finance these businesses, but um, we also analyze the businesses for gaps. We identify any gaps, we seal any loopholes, so that the businesses can be self-sustaining. Yes, we have a history of over-reliance of um, grants, and uh, that really 
uh, worked, did not work very well in this aquaculture sector after the economic stimulus program ended. But that does not mean that the businesses are not sustainable. If you work with the bus, we, we hold your hand, we work with you, we walk with you, we ensure that um, everything is running and operating efficiently and effectively. So um, another thing that uh, we're doing as BASPs is, um, in a way, advocacy. We're trying to bring to the table all these, um, um, say, impact investors who look at the impact of your business more than they, they focus on the collateral aspect of it. So that has been a challenge in getting financing. But um, it's something that we're working towards. We're looking at uh, engineering um, various um, tools to more like financial engineering so that we can be able to address this issue of financing. Um, and uh, we advocate for blended financing whereby you can have a little bit of a grant but more of it more commercialized financing because it makes you as a business person more accountable and when you're more accountable when you have to repay somebody back then you will work even harder you know to make sure your business succeeds so that is just um, a few things here and there that we can talk about and also one of the reasons why i believe the economic stimulus plan um, worked for a short time and then later on did not work was because we didn't have enough information. There is so much data uh, that we have now collected over the years since 2009 to now. Um, the, the businesses now know, um, say, how long it takes to harvest the feed, what, uh, what food you need to feed, what, uh, we, we talk about the feed conversion ratio, what quality feeds you need to, to, to give your brood what type of breedstock you need to put in. For example, uh, we're talking about the Intilapia YY technology. All these things are, um, are turning around the sector and making the sector more investable. Thank you. Wow. So the issue of information gap uh, is quite critical to note. And uh, I mean, one of the ways that uh, we can transform agriculture is adoption of uh, technology. Which is, which is very important, and we'll go knees deep into that. But for starters, uh, looking, I'm still very passionate about that economic you know, uh, uh, program uh, by President, uh, let President Mwai Kibaki. In fact, right now we are in a transition uh, mode as a country, and uh, I'm listening to some of these debates. Nothing is being laid clearly in terms of doing what they will do for specific, you know, sectors. You ask somebody, what is your plan for aquaculture? They ask you again, what is aquaculture? That's where we are right now, though the political discourse at least has improved. So, uh, some, uh, I mean, Devil Catch, um, I know you run Aquarech, and there are some people who have been calling it Aquarec, yeah? Thinking it's, it's, it's some, some English name. Rech, I'm told it's, it's fish, yeah? And, it, and you guys are quite big on, on Marta's technology. Maybe that's why there is that confusion a little bit. Um, in terms of, of making an SME sustainable, first of all, talk to us about uh, aqua technology and the affordability of it for starters, even before somebody starts to adopt a technology in the aquaculture sector. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, my name is Devo Kitch, uh, CEO of Aquarage Limited. We are basically a platform that is enabling small and medium-sized fish farmers to connect to top quality feed manufacturers. We provide market access to the small and medium-sized fish farmers. And uh, we also do training and capacity building. All this is done through a mobile app technology called Aquarage Farmer App. Aquarage Farmer App is uh, available on, on Android. It's free for download. Uh, we don't charge it to any farmer. Our revenue model is uh, on the transaction of feeds and fish that is done on the platform. We are currently in uh, six counties, Kirinyaga, Kisumu, Siaya, Kakamega, uh, Busia and, and Homebay, and we are, we are scaling uh, the technology. 
So um, technology, I, I was a fish farmer for uh, four years in Lake Victoria. I, I was doing cage fish farming and uh, built one of the most uh, vibrant uh, cage fish farms. But in the process of uh, farming, uh, I realized a couple of challenges face farmers in the sector. One is when you farm fish, as much as the deficit is huge out there, there is no platform or way for you to connect to the market. Um, when you are sourcing for the quality feeds that you need to grow your fish within the eight to 10 months period, like commercial farms are doing, you have no access to this feed because it is largely imported feed. When you are looking at the good aquaculture practices that you need to adapt in order to improve your management practices, these are lacking for small and medium-sized fish farmers, and we miss them, so how could we get them? Um, when you are looking at uh, a flexible uh, payment solution for your feed, because it's a high-cost investment, um, not very many financial institutions are willing to give you feed, uh, uh, to give you cash and credit. And so the history behind AquaReach was actually formed as a platform, uh, a technological platform that will then enable communication between farmers and feed manufacturers, between farmers and traders, and between um, input suppliers and farmers. Um, that is how we developed Aquaresh. To date, a farmer in the rural part of, of uh, Kagio in, Kirinya in Kirinyaga is able to access top quality feed from Brazil by the click of a button. And uh, through a last mile distribution system, that farmer is able to reduce the production period from 16 months to 10 months. Significant impact in terms of productivity of the farmer. The same goes, the same story to the farmers that we are working with in the other counties. Um, we have gone further and even developed a flexible payment solution where farmers on our platform are able to access feed on a credit basis of up to 90 days. And we have a default rate of zero because our payment structure is based on the, of taking the fish that the farmer has produced. And through that we are able to catalyze the sector to move farmers from use of sinking marsh feed, which prolongs their production period up to 16 months, making the fish expensive and producing some of the skinniest fish you've ever imagined, to reducing that production by cutting off six months of production period, getting them to earn better, and producing quality fish that even when you're eating in the house, you are happy to eat fish that has been farmed. That's the kind of transformation technology um, has brought into the sector. Yeah. And it's incredible for you to know that um, maybe this will come later on because one of the arguments in the agricultural sector has been, what is the average age of a farmer? And always we throw up another figure, an ancestral figure, so to put it, yeah? A farmer, an average farmer in Kenya is 65 years. They cannot, in fact, they don't like smartphones, and you're making applications for them. Uh, for, for aqua sector and the, the places that you've operated, uh, how is the adoption, the uptake of this technology? I mean, I mean su surprisingly, the uptake of smartphone technology, the penetration of smartphone technology is quite, is quite high in the farmers. Uh, largely because the way the world has moved. The world has moved where you, you don't own smartphone just because of prestige. You need to use it to collect f money for funerals when your cousin or relative has died. <laughs> Otherwise, people don't attend our base anymore. So smartphone penetration is quite high, almost at 70%. Um, but what we have done is we have built both USSD platform, uh, star 483-1409 hash, allows you to buy the feed and we deliver it at your doorstep or the fish and we deliver it to your doorstep. Uh, then uh, those who are uh, on the smartphone side are able to download the application. Of course, with a smartphone-based application, you can access more services than USSD. Um, but uh, I would say close to 75% of the farmers we deal with are on smartphone. And these are farmers who are, uh, uh, I mean, their turnover in terms of what they harvest is about, what, 
400 kilograms per year, which is about 120,000 shillings turnover uh, in terms of revenue that we'll get from fish production. Uh, so there's high smartphone penetration, I will say, in the, in the farmer sector. All right. And remember, you can also be part of these conversations, Beer, because you know, sometimes when you're having panels, people who are seated here, they normally zone out. They're just waiting for the moderator to say, thank you very much. My name has been Noah Kipkemboy. Then you come back. So listen in carefully. If you have any questions, we shall be coming back to you. Uh, you can just raise your hand so that we note where you are. And later on, we'll come to you so that you direct to a specific individual the question. But I uh, want to come back to Phoebe. You noted we have a huge gap, a deficit when it comes to, to fish. And it's the same discussion when you go to the manufacturing sector. Deficit and local production has been low, so we have to import. In fact, as a country, we are a net importer of everything. And that is a bad place to be, you saw during COVID. So, based on your experience, I've seen you've worked in Mozambique, you've worked across the country. What can we do different? Can we fulfill this gap and deficit internally? How so? Uh, thank you, Kip. I think I also want to applaud the government for the efforts and the initiatives they've put in place. And during the economic stimulus program, the government constructed, I think, five or six cold storage across the country. Nyeri, Kakamega, Nyandiwa, Homa Bay, Rongo. Yeah, huge facilities that was to support the aquaculture production in the country. The structures have been neglected albeit for I think four which have now been hired by private sector who are using them to mop up the fish and um, store the fish and also sell the fish and I think that is Kakamega for some um, Rio fish who was here yesterday has uptaken the Homa Bay one there's um, Nyeri which is also going on so the infrastructure is there secondly there's quite a bit of um, uh, infrastructure development in terms of roads, particularly to support the, the cage culture, the cage um, fish farming in Lake Victoria. A lot of the beaches did not have good roads into the beaches. The government has been able to pave those roads. Uh, the other infrastructure um, a facility which has also been uh, uh, supported by the counties, the took the project. I don't think this is a good one. With due respect to um, uh, Mr. Mtandai, the counties are taking the responsibility of doing the business with the business people. They're supplying feed, fingerlings, and um, other uh, materials that the fish farmers need. Now, that is not a good stage to be because the business people should do business and make money. The government should only create and allow conducive environment, the infrastructural development, but not do the business. I've had quite a bit of um, cross with a few of them when we tell them that you should let the business people do the business. You should do the business of creating the environment. But they are still um, purchasing and supporting and allowing the grant syndrome to step in back again. It's also very no, not very easy for us to appreciate or even take care of things we get free. So you should be able to pay for something, then you respect it and scale it up properly. What we need to do, I think there should be a change because there are a lot of, uh, about six major projects now running on aquaculture. We should have some good change, some good conversation with the developing partners to be able to streamline with the government on how aquaculture should be approached. On the feeding regime, number one, the cost of feeding is very high, extremely high, that the farmers cannot make money. Number two, the transfer of knowledge and skills is a big issue. 
As I said yesterday, the men go to the workshop, they get the information and the knowledge. The chicks in the village run the ponds with nothing as basic management skills on these ponds. And the pond is as good as how it's managed. So those are areas that need a lot of input, need a lot of consideration. Uh, not lastly, but I think one other issue that will also need a lot of emphasis from the fishermen, uh, allow me to call you fisher folk, or fishermen and women. The fishy people, to be able to create uh, consortiums of working together. Currently, Egypt is the biggest export of fish in Africa. Where does it get the water? Does it have the comparative advantages we have? We have about eight water bodies in Kenya, from Lodwa to Baringo to Naivasha to Lake Victoria to Lake Jipe to Lake Kenyatta. We have water bodies, including the ocean. Yet, they produce the most fish in Africa. Where is the rain beating us? It's simply management systems. Basic management systems. Basic transfer of clear and good knowledge and skills to the people who want to invest. And for the counties and the government, please let us do the business. We pass when we don't do the business, but do not meddle in the business of the business people. Very important. Stop. Where did the rain start beating us? Matters management. Dear Scrupio on the ground. And, uh, you know, we've discussed the, the systems that are there so far operational in our local uh, agriculture market, especially the fish value chain. Um, I see sort of majority, there is sort of a centralized system where one person is, is farming fish, that person is also selling fish. So they are end to end. And as, I don't know how sustainable that is. Are there more sustainable and better uh, systems that can make our, our, our aquaculture sector more vibrant? Thank you, uh, Kip. Uh, I, I, would, I would wish to say that um, our approach in terms of um, the fish farming and um, its value chain is actually within um, the scope of trying to transition um, farmers from their current status, which is uh, informal to formal. We want to make sure that nobody is left behind. We would want to build an ecosystem whereby the feed production has its sector in terms of uh, its development. The fingerling production has its sector in terms of development. The cold chain infrastructure also has to have its own development whereby we have professionals who are handling that. The processing which we are in as anchor within that value chain also has the off-taker which are ourselves. And then now the market. We create opportunities as a value chain. So that makes it sustainable in terms of value chain actors. That is how we can reach the market and everybody has a piece of the pie within the table. And uh, Edna, looking at what um, Samuel has just talked about, uh, the more centralized system, which is end-to-end -end an individual vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more diversified system where, you know, people are empowered in different spaces, uh, the producers of fingerlings, uh, you know, all this, at least everyone is having a piece of the pie other than you just having the whole pie. In terms of funding, this one seems so easy to fund because I know you farm fish, I'll help you improve capacity there. I know you have a market 
pretty straightforward. And this, this other one, unless you have an aggregator that is coming and bringing all these different plants together, it becomes a little bit uh, different. So from a funder's perspective of somebody who's, who's geared towards m making finances flow into these SMEs, which systems work best and can attract uh, more, more funding? Um, okay. Um, from our experience as business advisory service providers, we've seen um, financiers are getting attracted to sectors that are quite well structured. For example, if we're to look at what we need to do and what we are working on in the aquaculture sector is what we're calling, calling contract inclusive contract farming, where we deal, um, we, aggregate, we aggregate the smallholder producers, right? And um, they do have contracts. This already makes them bankable. If, say, I have farmer A in Kakamega, farmer C in Siaya, another one in Busia, and they have a contract to supply DAS group, all right? Um, that farmer already is bankable. They can use this contract at the bank. They would walk to Equity Bank and show that they have a market for their produce. Already, that increases their bankability and, their, uh, and gives them a better chance of financing so we talk about inclusive and sustainable contract farming this also makes the smallholder producer more efficient more effective you know the business now becomes um, uh, more bankable uh, more sustainable at the level of the producer again when I when the producer knows that they have a place to sell their produce and that now we talk about the logistics the cold chain distribution if we we have um and i know um some is actively actively working on that whereby we have a cold chain distribution system so we i know my fish will be ready by end of this month i've already alerted the distribution channel they know they come and collect immediately the fish comes out of the water we know how perishable fish is they are put in um, cold chain facilities immediately we get um, funding for these reefers refrigerated trucks like that is an opportunity for someone in this entire value chain that's an opportunity right there for someone to invest in uh, cold chain facility transportation and immediately this is taken to the factory to the processing plant once the fish gets to the processing plant there's value addition to increase this, the shelf life of the fish we're talking about um, the small the smoking machine that uh, we have at the facilities in um, in Kakamega, a dust group facilities, this increases the shelf life of the fish by seven months. Already that's uh, making it possible for us to market the product. Or if we put this through the plate freezer, it increases the shelf life of the fish by two years. Two years. How, you know, you've already um, empowered the farmer because the farmer does not have to sell the fish at the farm. The farm get prices sometimes can be very, very bad. You can end up selling a kilo of fish for 30 shillings just because you have to get rid of this product before it rots. We know, again, that, that mit completely mitigates the risk of perishability of the product. So going back to how do we make this um, sector um, investable is by completely um, mitigating all these risks that are associated with, uh, with, with aquaculture and it is what we are in the process of doing. We have quite a huge uptaker in Western Kenya that is um, the dust group, you know, and uh, once we have, we have structured every single aspect of the value chain, then there's nothing, the, the sector will be unstoppable. Definitely unstoppable and I know you've been shown there we have 24 minutes yeah but this interview is unstoppable so we can go past no apologies for for the facilitators all right um i mean coming to dev so we've spoken about systems and uh you you know technology is a disruptor it's not a respecter of anyone it comes in and it if you're not ready for it my brother you will be swept by that flood what flood should we be expecting right now in the aquaculture sector with tech players like you coming on board strongly and offering tech like AquaRage uh, platforms? I don't know whether to 
call it a, a, a tsunami wave or something. Uh, but um, let me, uh, so like for example, in Aquarech we use um, IoT. IoT is Internet of Things um, to train farmers on precision fish feeding. And that simply means um, uh, teaching the farmer to calculate the exact amount of feed the fish needs to eat at which point in time. And in that way, you optimize uh, the feed conversion ratio. So you save the cost, save the environment, and uh, the farmer gets more return by, that, by those savings. Um, if you look at the IoT and the, the big data um, that is coming up, they are completely going to make aquaculture more productive. They are going to get, uh, make it uh, profitable. Uh, they are going to make it sustainable. And um, they are going to make it more inclusive. That's the kind of disruption that technology is, um, is bringing to the aquaculture sector. FAO, if I give an example, estimates that uh, by 2030, aquaculture in Africa will have grown by 350%. 2050, 558 percent. What that means is aquaculture by 2050 will have re replaced wild fisheries, meaning the fish that you hunt, because population of Africa is growing, rivers are not growing, right? The lakes are still the same. The quantity of fish that was there since our grandfathers were there is getting depleted. The blue economy the new word in town, blue economy, uh, was actually coined out of the idea that how can we sustainably uh, ex explore the resources around large water bodies. And this is where exactly where aquaculture fits in. Technology is going to be, and it is already, a key driver towards how aquaculture can harness the potential of these large water bodies to feed the population of Africa that is growing. Uh, right now, uh, in the counties that we operate in, a farmer doesn't have to look for feed from anywhere. He has it on the phone. And with that, one of the biggest challenges that the aquaculture sector has faced is the high fragmentation of the sector. You have up to 10 middlemen that exist between the time the fish is produced to the time the fish lands in this beautiful hotel, when you get to pay for it very expensively. Technology is coming in to disrupt that by opening up direct communication between the farmer and the market player. And in each case, the farmer has the ability to see the market dynamics, such as prices, and be able to make informed decisions. If you add that with the infrastructure around the technology, such as coaching facilities and IoTs and um, AIs and all this, you are able to transform the sector completely from the current problems that it faces to a very productive sector. And those are the kind of disruptions that we want to see happen in the agriculture sector. That's why we are keen to be a disruptive champion in the agriculture. I mean, Dev, uh, just, just to rebutter that, not necessarily even rebutter, but just to think about it, because he wants to remove all intermediaries, yeah? He wants, I have a feeling he wants to cut DS out of this equation, totally. Like, let's just put DS aside. Farmer, talk to, 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 to the market. Is it something that uh, you are in full support? Le uh, le le let, me, let me help there a little bit. <laughs> uh, the idea is, can DAS, who is an aggregator, get a platform to interact directly with the farmer and avoid the middlemen that exist between the farmer and DAS? That's the kind of technology-enabling platform that we are providing. And um, with that, there is fairness in, 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 in transaction. There should be fairness. I mean, the farmer should make some money, otherwise we won't have fish to eat. That's, that's, my, that's my comment, thanks. Sam? Uh, thank you. 
uh, DAS has actually put in place structures that um, give assurance to the market in terms of uh, our quality standards, which um, the farmer cannot provide to the market. Like, for example, now, as we, as we, as we see today, our organization has the capacity and also the certification to export which the farmer doesn't have. So we, we actually give them access to the market uh, that they cannot reach. There are markets that maybe the farmer can reach that is um, low level, but when you talk about high level, then you, you have to deal with uh, a processor who has certifications that are recommended for export. So that is where we come in, and that is how we open up even for farmers, the export market for their produce, which um, we definitely uh, need in terms of um, revenue from uh, the export market also. Definitely. Uh, Phoebe, is, is that a huge scourge in the uh, sector right now as you speak, the middlemen that are... Um, you know, uh, Akorich is trying to cut out, but at the same time having legit people to give uh, confidence and set standards not only for Kenya but internationally too for our products. Uh, thank you, Kip. In all value chains, middlemen exist. They are called agents, they are called middlemen, they are called brokers. They exist. These are our own sons, our own husbands, our brothers and sisters. We must allow them to exist. The only thing we need to do is clearly restructure the value chain or the sub-value chain that you're dealing in so that you can ac accommodate the middlemen and the brokers so that everybody is rewarded equitably. Proper value chains function. Middlemen are critical in terms of market acquisition and getting market access issues. They are. And we cannot uh, um, uh, make a decision that we want to relegate the middlemen outside the mainstream. In all sectors, the subsectors, middlemen exist, and I think they play a critical role that should be appreciated and valued. They have to eat. The children have to go to school. Dev. Dev. We're just looking at you, yeah? We are wondering now, <laughs> these people have families. They have to eat. <laughs> uh, their children have to go to school. <laughs> Farmers' children have to go to school too. Um, everybody has to go to school <laughs> if you have a child. Um, what um, we are saying is a highly fragmented sector disadvantages the farmer. And so what we are doing in the aquaculture sector is to create an open trading platform. The beauty of an open trading platform is that it doesn't um, segregate. It allows middlemen and farmers to transact and engage in an open platform. And the, the platform is so open that a middleman is able to see the price that the farmers are bidding for. And uh, willing buyer, willing seller basis. So we are not locking out anyone. What we are actually doing is to make the sector open and transparent and that has given middlemen, in fact, more access to information about available sources of fish. Because one of the reasons why a farmer is uh, uh, pushed down with low prices is because of lack of alternative sources of market and middlemen also relying on one particular source of fish. However, if you provide a platform that enables middlemen, whichever where they are, farmers, whichever place they are, to connect and trade openly and freely, you empower the farmer to make money. The middlemen have very many alternative sources, and so business booms. That's actually what we want to see. As opposed to a case where farmer does not even know where the market is, he gets um, invited by one middleman, 
to sell his fish. Then he realizes he has sold his fish at 230 shillings, whereas the farmer next door has sold his fish at 330 shillings. Even that 330 shillings has been paid by the middleman. What about if we had a platform that will allow everybody to connect to each other and everybody to trade? Middlemen will make more money because then they have abundance of supply. Farmers will make more money because they get better prices as a result of continuous bidding. Okay, definitely. Edna, briefly, highly fragmented system vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis, it is sort of, sort of formalizing the highly informal. Uh, and that is sort of a huge prerequisite for, you know, to get support, to get funding, to get credit to these farmers. Uh, how, how easy has that been? What has been the process from, from your understanding and experience? Well, it's not been that easy, um, but it's not impossible. It is not impossible at all. Um, we're talking about the entire aquaculture system. First of all, there is market for the product. The most important thing is there is market. Um, did you ever envision um, seeing a fish kiosk, fish butchery in Kitengela? Kitengela has predominantly been, I mean Kajiado County, predominantly been um, beef eating region. So see, there is market, there is opportunity in the sector. We have tightened the market. We're still working on it. Um, you should be able to walk to supermarkets and see branded products from various um, fish farms. That is actually possible. So tighten the market, tighten the distribution um, and logistics um, chain, you know, tighten the supply in terms of uh, the, at the producer level. And um, there is room for uh, middlemen to fit in any, any part of the value chain. I mean, they can recalibrate. There's opportunity. There's, there's, um, there's demand for the product. There's supply for the product up in between their jobs being created. You don't have to just be a middleman to go collect fish at the farm and take it to market. There are other things you can do within the value chain. So, yes, highly fragmented, but working towards structure the entire value chain have we made headway yes we have is it um, attractive enough for the investors not quite yet but if they don't jump on the bandwagon they'll come when the share prices are too high you need yeah. <laughs> yeah. this is the time <laughs> definitely it, it yes has that feeling and, of and most importantly not to leave the 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 work we do as advisors out of it it's very important because we're targeting each and every actor in the value chain we're working with each and everyone to solidify this entire system so, so that we can make it sustainable, we can make it scalable. Every single person in the value chain are working with them. Incredible. I think it's the perfect time to open up. I want to open up the Q&A segment. Um, La Route. Oh, yeah, that's you know, okay. You know, There's I've struggled right here. the name, yeah? Uh, <laughs> here here we go. The floor is yours. Sure, she's right here. Thanks, Rugut. My name is Damaris Dira, and uh, I'm a value chain and capacity building service provider for poultry value chain, not for fish. However, I see a lot of similarities between the two, and therefore I have noted a few issues that I would like to just bring to the discussion. And thank you because I'm the aspect of having end-to-end -end service provision and matters of middlemen, you know, coming into play. And my question is that in the value chain of poultry, we've had to create cooperatives something that has not been very imminent in that kind of a value chain, especially in the counties where we operate, which is Homer Bay County. And there has been a lot of issues trying to solidify these POs, the producer organizations, where the farmer needs to run to for aggregation, or even as collection centers so that they can gain accessibility to the markets. The POs themselves or the cooperatives themselves need a lot of help for them to come to bar 
for them to be able to offer that service to the farmer. And therefore, there's a lot of challenges trying to federate and link these farmers to these cooperatives. So my question is, does Aquaretch have a feature that allows, if not the middlemen, and thank you because you have uh, explained it quite well that it allows us to have a platform that has an open interaction amongst everyone within the value chain. What about the producer organizations that I would call cooperatives in this case? And if you have taken care of that, if you have accommodated them into that system, what have been the challenges and what has worked well for you that we can adopt into the poultry value chain? Right, thank you for that question. Can we have... Noah, can we try and check for another question, maybe? Yes. Do you have another Is question? Is there any other question in the room? Yes. Yeah, One right perfect. there. Okay, for the meantime, as the question is coming in, please make sure that you fill the evaluation forms on your table and leave them on the table once the sessions are over. We really request you to do that because we value your feedback. Uh, thank you. My question is uh, mostly in the structured markets or uh, the, of the of taking, the structured of taking, uh, we don't have cash payments. I don't know if you do cash payments. So our middlemen are uh, very present because they pay on cash. So how are we taking care of side selling? Because you can have contracted a farmer, but then when I'm a middleman and I come with cash money, and my kid have been sent out of school, I'll opt to sell to the middleman. So how are you taking care of the side selling? Thank you. Okay. No, I'll throw it back to you. Actually, uh, there's this, one more. Yeah, one <laughs> more. Thank you. My name is Michael Ranji. I'm a region, region Food and Agriculture Equity Bank, uh, Nairobi. Now, my question is, what are you doing uh, to integrate youth into fish farming? Because I consider this very perfect for our youth. Yes, there's Where? a gentleman right here at the front. At the front, okay. By the way, I like your dress. It's very African, yeah? That's a nice dress. Come on, guys. <laughs> Appreciate. All right, thank you. My name is uh, Moses Sitati from USAID. My question is um, uh, touching on the comment that came up on the business of, of business, um, you know, is, of the farmers anyway, is to focus on business. Uh, I wanted to ask if we could get comments from the panel on... Um, as much as entrepreneurs, yes, you focus on the business, there is still the interface with the public sector, with the government counterparts. What support, capacities, or what experiences have um, you had as from the private sector side engaging uh, with the public, your, the public counterparts for a more vibrant and stronger business environment? Maybe just your experiences there and areas for growth and improvement. Right, lovely. I uh, hope we haven't closed anyone out with the eight minutes that we have. Yeah, we still have one more. I still one more. So those will be five. Five questions in eight minutes. Thank you very much. My name is Ivy. I'm a fish farmer in uh, Busia. And my question is to Aquaretch. I know he mentioned that he gives a credit period of uh, 90 days for feeds. Uh, I've just started the business of fish farming, so what are the terms and conditions for new farmers who are engaging in the business? I understand and I know uh, the feeds are very expensive, like the financial institutions were being told yesterday they would look at the turnover, but you see we are new in the business, so I think it would be nice to know, and I can see he said uh, up to 90 days, and fish takes like uh, nine months to mature and sell. Thank you very much. All right. Allow me to close the Q&A session. No, you can take it over. All right. Thank you very much. So, Dev, you're going to handle uh, the first question and the last question, the opener and the finisher. So, the cooperative speed that was asked firstly and also uh, 
the terms and conditions from Ivy, who is a fish farmer. So, what has worked between Aquarage Limited and the producer organizations that we have worked with? So, uh, let me give an example. The program that has uh, helped us scale into four counties, it's a World Bank program called um, Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Project. Uh, it has a component of, uh, a, a subcomponent called Disruptive Agricultural Technology. And uh, what we are doing through that program is actually working with the producer, farmer producer organizations or producer, producer groups uh, in clusters of farmers that exist in those counties. Uh, and through that, what we are doing is, uh, through the group, we are, we are able to identify lead, lead farmers in the, in the group. And using those lead farmers, uh, lead farmers for us is a farmer one who is recording the daily data that we want on the application um, and who is following some good aquaculture practices that or protocol that we have laid between us and the farmer and uh, who, are, who is actually a real farmer spending time farming the fish and uh, through that we are then able to utilize county government physical infrastructure these are cold chain facilities that have been in existence for uh, almost a decade or uh, 10 years and above and have never been utilized. So we work with those producer organizations to aggregate fish from them directly and uh, take them to the cold, cold chain facilities. We pay cash for any farmer that we work with on the, on the, in the producer organizations. Now, some of these producer organizations, what you've seen is they prefer, you, they negotiate with you the price at which you are buying the fish and you pay each farmer directly because they, they are less formally structured. But they exist amorphously as a group. In some cases where we have uh, one producer organization in Syria that existed as a group, we have paid uh, a check to, to the group. Uh, but even though the farming was done at individual uh, farmers. So it is still a very complex thing that we are trying to navigate. We are s eight months into the program since we started working with these producer organizations. But so far what we have seen is having a collective uh, discussion with the producer, farmer producer groups uh, has been uh, successful in terms of uh, agreeing even on the price at which they are buying the feed at. And that's what we want to see. Because again, if we enable them to access the feed at an affordable price, they are able to see the impact of what we are saying on, on the platform. But we are yet to see how it will happen when we meet a producer organization that is an aggregator, right, and has a select group of farmers working under them. It will, it will be a matter of negotiating on the price at which they aggregate the fish and how much we can take the fish that they have aggregated to come to our platform. But it's possible uh, for that. Um, the credit financing that we advance, we have worked with the farmers who are three months to harvest. And these farmers who are three months to harvest, one thing that we have insisted is that they must be recording certain data daily on the platform. And through that, we are able to track the growth of fish from the time they put the fish in the pond or stock the pond to the time the fish is ready for harvesting. So you are not just going to say, we advance you 20 bags of feed costing $500, right? And we've not seen the way that fish has grown in stages on the application. So from the back end, we are able to track the growth of fish uh, per farm, per cage, or per pond. And through that, it increases your credit rating. The more data you put on that platform, the more credit we can avail to you, because then that one tells us that you are actually feeding the fish and we are able to see the risk to which we can give you feed. Um, or, or advance of feed to your platform. Side selling of the fish and how do you take care of it? Again, it is strictly through pharma groups um, because pharma groups are able to coordinate harvesting of the fish. Um, so that's how we are managing it at the moment. But that's also the reason why we have capped the credit period to strictly 90 days. Uh, hopefully with more data coming on the platform, we can scale it to more months uh, for the production cycle of the farm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Phoebe, uh, thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, Kip. I think there are two issues. One is on the COPs, and the other one is about um, engaging the public sector. All these projects that have attempted to upscale and sustain aquaculture have developed producer groups. Some have been formulated eventually to cooperatives. However, many of them don't survive beyond the project. You find that once the project ceases to exist, a lot of them also cease existence. Now that's a big challenge because a lot of money is put into these projects and if, they are put in, uh, if a lot of money is put in the projects and the uptakers who are the public and the business community do not retain the structures and the systems which were put in place, it becomes very difficult for us to move forward. So we need to know well, how can we do it differently such that at the end of the project, the cooperatives remain in place to continue and sustain that project. About engaging the public, I think is one of the most important things that any project should be able to do, either at multilateral, at the trilateral, or you can't have a project in a country without the mainline ministries. We have to engage them, because in all these projects, Aquaculture included, there's a lot of constraints and a lot of challenges. And some of these challenges, the only people who can lift them or ease them mainly comes from the public sector domain. A lot of constraints, infrastructure, even information transfer, technology, all that are lifted by the public sector. You find that the private sector has also its own challenges like uptaking knowledge, uptaking skills, being able to uptake capacity building. Those are constraints and challenges that can be midwifed by both the development partners and the uptakers who are the business community. What I meant was that, for example, when the stimulus economic project came to the end, you still found county governments, up to today as I talk, they buy fingerlings for the farmers, they buy feeds for the farmers, they support the farmers to market. Very good. What about tomorrow? These farmers should have commercialized their activities and made sure that those activities are able to earn, are able to grow. And that can only happen if they commercialize it and uptake the responsibility of building the businesses and scaling. It's not right that the government will keep buying for them. The government will also go dry. So we cannot depend on the government stocking, restocking for the farmers. Maybe the beginning like what uh, His Excellency the late Mwai Kibaki did was good initiative. We still have results up to now. We still have impacts in place up to now. A last comment, Kip. There are two things in the aquaculture sector. One is about the uptake of artisanal processors. And this is where the women are. The government should be able to create some structures to support the processing of fish at those local la low levels. Most of it is quite unhygienic, in many places where they are processed, they don't have structures that are conducive enough to give food safety to the fish and the women in the aquaculture sector. Secondly, I think there's a phenomenon of, um, what do you call it, a tsunami of e-commerce coming in and emerging. And allow me to brag that Kenya is one of the most blessed countries with e-commerce from the bottom of the pyramid to the top. We should be able also to embrace e-commerce where you can order your fish online. It can be delivered by a border border. You pay the border border online when I'm seated in Nairobi comfortably. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, some, some of the questions that have been raised, I had to use some because some of the questions, uh, but uh, just just talk to us, which one would you like to respond? I've seen youth integration and also the issue of cash payments and cooperatives. Um, the 
there's one question that uh, was actually dealing with support, support to farmers. Yes. Yeah. Um, currently, we are carrying out, um, we, we are actually doing a, a, a survey that is going to lead to a pilot project that uh, we are carrying out uh, for fish farmers. Uh, we are onboarding 300 farmers and um, the survey that we carried out actually gave us a response that around about 70% of those who are going to participate were women and youth. And um, apparently the women who we have actually uh, taken up their um, credentials and uh, run through our system, we found out that on less than 5% could actually access credit, meaning that um, they could not actually go through the collateralization process to enable them access credit. That's through um, our partners who are AFC. I think I saw Bonano who was seated here. So we actually talked to uh, the Swedish government through CEDA and um, we got uh, support from um, their um, implementing wing that is FSD financial deepening sector and um, we are going to cushion these women and youth who are vulnerable in terms of access to finance to enable them be part of the program. So that is one aspect that uh, we are actually doing to enable uh, farmers access finance. Uh, there is also the aspect of access to market, which uh, we are doing through our system that has been developed for export and also for local market at high level. Yeah, so there are those two things and then there's also uh, capacity building which we are carrying out with, uh, with, in, in partnership with FSD and also we are also training farmers on um, food safety. We are also training them on um, uh, feeding regimes. We are also training them on um, water quality measures that they're supposed to uh, take care of in terms of pond management. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, we are doing which I think uh, I might not uh, be able to articulate today. All right. But given an opportunity, we will uh, actually talk about it. Definitely. Uh, You've realized that the controller of the screens is very proudly Ooh, putting up, up, time's yeah. up, yeah? <laughs> and we are proudly ignoring, yeah? We're on the last person, don't you worry, okay? And now, as you finish up, you've seen concerns from a farmer, uh, somebody from a different valley chain that they can borrow from their aqua or we can borrow from them. Uh, what would you like to address as we finish up? I would like to address um, two issues on site selling. Um, despite having a contract with the aggregators, it doesn't mean that you're not paid cash. Um, the, uh, the aggregators, um, like um, Sam here or and Dave, they have to pay in cash because they know if they don't do that, you're not going to supply them with the product. So indeed, they, they make the payments in cash within, I believe, um, 24 hours for Sam, right? after you because um, he has to take the product uh, for testing. They have a laboratory at the facility to ensure quality of the product. So they are paid within 24 hours. Side selling will also be covered by the fact that um, the broker will not vouch for you when you're going to the bank to ask for a loan. However, showing that you have a contract with um, an aggregator and uh, there's a track record of how much you've been paid, how much you've invoiced, say, over time, that actually makes you bankable and makes you get a loan for other things. You know, it just doesn't have to be for the, um, just for the business itself. So that curbs the issue of side selling. When you, when you talk about integrating the youth in fish farming, um, 
it's a challenge because we know most of uh, financiers have uh, normally requests for title deeds or logbooks and this our young people really do not have they've not had <laughs> enough chances or probably enough time <laughs> to be able to amass property so for that uh, we advocate for the youth forming groups whereby they guarantee each other these guarantees are what is used as collateral and um, we are also working with uh, financial institutions to recognize the different sectors and just to understand the sector. If you understand um, a particular sector, then you can be able to fund it. You know, we can work together to mitigate the risks um, that are there. And um, it's more, again, on advocacy with um, everybody, the producers, the government, financial institutions and all that so uh, another thing that attracts the youth to fish farming is now there's information there's a lot of information out there you know what you need to do you know how you need to feed your fish you know all that stuff you need you know the kind of stock the brood stock you 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 have to have in order to um end up operating as efficiently as possible one more thing um yes there's been a lot of dependence on aid but um, our work as business advisors, and I believe uh, my colleague Phoebe can attest to it, is transitioning the businesses to become more independent, more commercialized, because that's the only way we can sustain our economy. Um, moving from non-commercialized funding to commercialized funding gives you um, it, it, it makes you more accountable. It gives you the drive to do better, you know? And that's the driving force of our economy, I believe. So, um, closing remarks? Of course. That was just, that, that was just responding my, to the my questions. My friends, may, may I just <laughs> be honest with, with the timekeeper? Timekeeper, <laughs> would you add us just five minutes? Yeah? Just five minutes. Yeah? Closing remarks, we go that way, then we finish. You see the way you... Time is up. <laughs> Please We've proceed. We've had enough. Edna. We can go on and on clearly. Please. All right. Um, we just like to, um, you know, um, encourage basically um, the investors to look at this sector differently because the aquaculture sector addresses national and global challenges, you know? While doing this, we're, we're addressing these challenges while making money for those in the business of making money. And that's important. Um, we're addressing the challenges of food security. We're talking about SDGs like no poverty. We're talking about gender equality because fish farming is inclusive. It takes care of um, women, men, youth. Every group is taken care of. We're talking about climate action. You know, we're talking about um, the issues of um, life below water. Um, we would like to work as advisors and as Afriscope, we would like to work with every actor in the value chain to just make sure we make this um, sector sustainable, scalable, and we'd like to see um, a, a new wave of financing coming into the sector. So, yeah, we're open to work with anybody and everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Sam, uh, your closing remarks briefly. You see we have four minutes, so le in less than a minute, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, currently, the per capita fish for Kenya stands at three kilos per head per head per year. Uh, the global per capita is at 20 kilos per head per year. Nigeria has around 40 per head per year. I think that the deficit that we have is as a result of lack of structures that have not been put in place in terms of investments, which personally as a businessman I might not be able to put in, in terms of uh, capacity building of farmers, in terms of um, cold chain infrastructure, in terms of uh, quality feeds, 
um, in terms of um, training of these farmers and most importantly access to finance which needs to be looked at because as I've said even earlier most of these farmers are women and um, when it comes to collateral they don't possess title deeds and we need to make sure that uh, they have the financing that is required because the sector is bankable and um, it has a future and um, I think that um, fish business is um, a business that has a cycle that is better than other value chains um, if it is actually managed well and um, given the right um, thought in terms of investments and also uh, support um, of uh, the other sectors. All right. Yes, thank, thank you me. very much. Dave, please. Thank you. We intend to launch uh, Aquarage Fish uh, outlet and distribution in Nairobi in December. And uh, I hope you will be our first customers to taste the fish. Tell us how our farmers' fish taste like. This will be fish that will be produced by Aquarage fish farmers, the 2,000 that we have on the platform, and we are still looking at growing more. We are uh, restructuring even the ponds and the cages so that we can move farmers from peasant fish farming to small commercial farms, and by doing so, make it more profitable for the farmers. And we are in the process of uh, fundraising, thanks to Afriscope, we have worked very well. Uh, they have connected us through the uh, Kenya Investment in Kansom to various investors who have invested in us, and we are still looking for more. So thank you very much, and uh, I can't wait to bring Aquarage Fish to Nairobi in December, hopefully before Christmas. Yeah, thank we you. can't wait to have Aquarage Fish. Uh, amazing. Get him a coffee. Don't clap half-heartedly. We need the fish to arrive. He might change his mind. He says, they didn't even clap for me. I'm not bringing fish. Anyway, thank you very much, Dave. And finally, Phoebe. Uh, thank you, Kip. I think aquaculture is one of the most virgin subsector of agriculture. There's a huge potential for exhausting the natural resources that we have in Kenya. We need to put a few things right. One is the taxation of the equipment to develop aquaculture. Two is the taxation regimes of equipment to develop aquaculture. Three, all the farmers who are farming aquaculture should be able to come together to have their acts right, to be able to have a voice, to engage with the government, to address the issues that the government can lift. Fourth, Continuous research to give us development and better species of fish to farm. I think the land use also is an issue. By the way, Sam, the women are not the farmers. The women are the workers on these ponds. The men are the farmers. The women work for these men. Um, finally, the issue of transfer of knowledge and skills. We should be able to embrace that very well and uptake the knowledge and skills that is being transferred to the farmers and to all the actors within the value chain. It's a virgin value chain. Please, if you feel like doing business, step into the aquaculture. There's a lot of potential. If Egypt is doing it without a single drop of water, what can Kenya do with 10 water bodies in the country? Thank you. Wow, amazing. I appreciate uh, my panelists. At the far end, we have Phoebe Ward, Chief Executive Officer, Lamero Consult, Begeni Makofi Tafadali. Yes, next to how we have Devil Ketch uh, from Aquarage. Yeah, don't call it Aquarek, I'm beginning my coffee to Fadali. Next to him, we have Samuel Ondiek from DS Group. And uh, finally, we have Edna Odalo, MD Afriscope Limited. Once again, I appreciate my wonderful panel. Yes, the time is up and we are done with the panel. How do you feel? I feel a lot of just freedom. I just feel like flying away from here and buying Aquarage fish. All right, so let us be on our feet even as our panelists stand up. Uh, 
Walk to your neighbor and tell them, this is my greatest take away from the fish dish. Even amongst you, this is my greatest take away from the fish dish. Speak, speak to your neighbor.